norms and various other things. And so I think that one, again, that's why I'm so supportive of allies and, uh, and, 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 and lashing up with it with our cadet education, because I think a lot of these things generationally, if you can start learning these now and you can begin to understand and, and speak a similar vernacular and begin to bridge those divides, then you don't end up having the problems that I see among my peers, my colleagues, and, uh, and sort of what goes on at that level. Um, so what I hope to do here is, is get you uh, uh, two vantage points um, that uh, for, for people who spend time within that sphere, and uh, again, having knowing them personally, and professionally, and through other recommendations, I uh, think they've innovatively found ways to go ahead and do that. Um, so we'll start with Vina Chang, um, who's the CEO of uh, Linking the World. Uh, she'll highlight some of her programs and things she's doing, both in the world of. Uh, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, um, particularly as well as some of the other things she's done with uh, some programs with the Navy uh, in response to, to humanitarian assistance and disaster responses uh, all over the world. Um, she had an appreciation sort of from, from that, uh, uh, from a, a, what a, a very large uh, administration, uh, excuse me, a uh, enterprise um, at the federal level can do and how it can work bridge across those things. So we'll start with me and let her uh, present and then uh, afterwards we'll go and listen and go to the Q&A. So please, Nina, thank you. Thanks so much for having me. It's such an honor and a privilege to be among such high caliber leaders that are working to address the challenges and the opportunities in uh, coordinated humanitarian action, especially looking at the relationship between civilian and military actors. I personally truly believe that these relationships will lead the United States and the world into a more stable and um, secure, resilient future. I serve currently as the CEO for an international humanitarian aid organization called Linking the World. We were founded in 1997 and currently operate in 43 countries um, and we're headquartered in the great country of Texas. <laughs> we uh, operate in disaster zones, uh, conflict zones, we're in places like Somalia, Kenya, Myanmar, uh, a school in Afghanistan, and we work in developing nations as well. So in our world today, one in eight people still live in extreme poverty and experience extreme hunger. Now outside of the humanitarian imperative, uh, we understand that this contributes to instability and is a breeding ground for conflict. So in our world today, as an organization, we understand that we must be open to new models for, um, for collaboration, cross-sector collaboration, and advanced response methodology. And for us, it's a high priority. So coordinated civil military operations in a disaster zone is very different from an armed conflict zone. Um, in the field, you'll realize that the very same NGOs that are so willing, excited to collaborate with you in a disaster zone will do a seeming about face in a disaster in a conflict zone. And so uh, I'll keep this in the context of responding to natural disasters. So I have kind of a wide spectrum of experience in the space, not only coming from a military family, but I'm the child of two commanding officers in the Salvation Army. So that childhood exposed me to the entire economic spectrum. It immersed me in the social programs, world missions around the world, a lot of disaster response operations just because of the inherent work that my parents did. But I was able to see firsthand the value of these long-term trusted relationships that NGOs had with communities all around the world. And then when disasters would hit these communities, I saw the incredible value that these NGOs brought to the military actors that would come in with all these capabilities. The NGOs not only uh, in, had embedded relationships, they knew the people, spoke the language, knew the infrastructure, physical, political, so they were able to help the first responders navigate very quickly, efficiently, and not only that, with, were they the first responders, so were their local partners. Um, go ahead. My, my personal career with Linking the World, this organization, actually started with the civil military operation um, after the earthquake in Haiti during Operation Unified Response. And since then, every crisis that Linking the World has responded to has had some component of civil military coordination, <coughs> most notably with the Philippine, uh, during the response for Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines. And 
just last week I was in Vanuatu working with our Australian military counterpart, learning quite a bit about how differently their military response works and uh, working through their Department of uh, Foreign Affairs and Trade. Vanuatu was hit with the Category 5 storm that destroyed over 95% of all the homes in the country. So why do NGOs like ours uh, coordinate with the military? Well, theoretically, uh, coordination would help reduce redundancy and duplication in efforts. Um, we should be able to leverage assets and relationships and ensure, and we'd like to ensure a transition into a longer term developmental phase. The last thing we want to do is take people from one cycle of extreme poverty or disaster zone straight into another cycle of dependence on aid. And then there's you know, the problem of military actors in uniform being the first deli delivery of aid and then seemingly uh, abandoning the people when they withdraw. So we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, also, some NGOs who believe that true neutrality is a farce will argue that the imperative for coordination is really a na national security issue, that if we do not act in a post-9-11 world, then we're leaving a space for extremist groups to come in and target vulnerable populations in order to influence with their ideology. We all know the famous words of uh, former Secretary of State Colin Powell, who called on NGOs to be force multipliers. And uh, the most recent State Department's diplomacy review reported that NGOs are acting more as an influencer in international affairs. Uh, personally, I've seen it happen in the field. I'll give you two examples. Uh, we work with a refugee population in Myanmar. The Rohingya people are ethnic minority. They are a burden to the host nation. And we have a very small program there but we've seen quite organized non-state actors coming in giving aid in the name of their ideology. So you can see the, the danger uh, inherent in groups coming in and influencing vulnerable populations have very little or nothing to lose. Um, after Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, we know of uh, specific communities that are sympathizers of extremist groups, literal training grounds for insurgents deploying around the world. And we've seen foreign aid that have come in, um, that have reached, given, reached those communities giving lifelines to, to groups like that. And, and uh, whether it's in the name of true humanitarianism, I'm sure that as people working for the Department of Defense, that's not an ideal situation. So we do this because we see the value in creating a dialogue with more permanent NGO missions on the ground who can help with things like cultural awareness, attention to the long-term consequences, and consideration on how to increase a population sense of security and progress in the community. So that being said, through working with many other NGO agencies and military groups, I seem to hear familiar frustration during every disaster response operation. Of course, um, duplication of efforts and the redundancy of work that's being done. So time wasted, uh, lives lost, a lot of donor dollars wasted because of that. Um, the lack of understanding from NGOs on how the military operates, your mandates, and um, a lot of NGOs seem to have a lot of unreasonable expectations of access to your military assets during times of disaster. Um, and then on the other side, a lack of understanding from the military on the mission op objectives of NGOs and, uh, I, and not understanding why even we can't seem to coordinate with one another in a disaster situation. And of course, the important issue of the compromise and preserving of neutrality in a space. <coughs> Go ahead. So p part of our package of solutions for the future is how we can leverage from the examples and the standards that have been set by the US military. In a lot of instances, the last thing we really want to do is to go against the policies and procedures that have been put in place to protect your processes. So I can't think of a better example than uh, give you than one of our own programs. It's called HALO. HALO stands for Help and Locate Operations and it's our use of UAVs in a disaster response situation to obtain situational awareness through imagery, analytics, and data. Can we get sound on that? <coughs> Can you 
You know, after every disaster, the Department of Defense are able to deploy their UAV assets and satellite imagery to gain high quality crisis maps. And uh, usually those outputs are classified. So by the time that first responders and NGOs get to those, either the data is outdated um, or, or we're not really able to obtain it. So we tasked a team within our organization to create a, a way that we can get our own imagery so that we can share it with first responders and help coordinate relief efforts in real time. Oh, you've got to check in on SATCOM with Jonathan. AFER, my radios. Jennifer, Machete 1 2, checking in as frag. Machete 1 2, copy as frag. Janet, we're assuming hybrid until Salsa comes up on station in approximately 20 miles. Machete 1 2, copy, be advised. We also have medevac pay folks on the 10 minute alert out of Port au Prince. Machete 1 2, copy, and en route our grids India 0 2 through India 0 5. Do you see that down there? Who's got that grid? Uh, according to the airspace control order, Foxtrot 04 is assigned to that NGO Halo. They got cleared for very low ops through the Civil Military Operations Center. They're hooked with those small drop-capable drones operating out of multiple locations around the island. There's one in that small open area about three miles off our right wing. Okay, cool. Call it into Jada for passing the Halo Ops. On it. Jada Haney, Machete 1 2, in flight report. Say when ready to copy. Machete 1 2, go with in flight report. Jada, Machete 1 2, current grid location. Echo 04, 2500 feet. Current observation multiple downed power lines, washed out roads, multiple people in the area moving north. Request pass to Halo Ops, status of Echo 04. Recommend priority investigation, Echo 04 and surround. Using Halo UAS for real-time sequencing of aid. Machete copy all, will relate to Halo Ops. Hey, from all the reports I've heard, those Halo Ops guys have been all over this mission. On time, on target, right down in the weeds. Real force multipliers for this mission. I heard say... Help getting a group percentages up there. Even in post disaster scenarios, UAVs can do things like we can put an infrared and thermal imaging to mitigate the spread of disease by measuring high grade fevers in a refugee camp, or we've been using it to test uh, to detect landmines, and now we're looking to try to uh, clear landmines. And of course, um, if we empower local communities that are high risk, we can really help them with their disaster preparedness initiatives. Um, and then with UAVs, a great a scenario of a great civil military partnership could be exploring the use of um, decommissioned governmental assets, such as like the KMAX or the ARIES platforms, which would help NGOs like ours raise our, our um, payload capabilities. I think KMAXs can carry like 5,000 pounds right now drones that I know of that any NGO can operate carries about 50 pounds. Go ahead. So the importance here is the appropriate use of capacity and capabilities, both sides understanding the principles in which we operate. Uh, humanitarian groups, we strive to adhere to the core principles of neutrality, impartiality, um, operational independence. Um, what's clear is that with the constant rise of political instability, poverty, and natural disasters, I believe we must work together to stand united uh, in the face of more frequent and complex humanitarian emergencies. And I see this as an opportunity for us to not only continue saving lives, but to, as we share these friendships and relationships around the world, to foster peace.